Good morning, everybody. Uh, so just to remind everybody that there's also plenty of room for seating in Hall C. So if you're struggling to find a seat, there's plenty of room there. OK, so I'm delighted to introduce Brendan Fry. Brendan is a professor at the University of Toronto with appointments in both engineering and medicine. He's made fundamental contributions in both machine learning and genomics. So during his PhD with Jeff Hinton, he co-invented the wake-sleep algorithm, which is a precursor to the variational autoencoders and GANs that we know and love today. He's also made seminal contributions to message passing and factor graphs. And he's also the inventor of affinity propagation, which is a clustering algorithm widely used in the sciences for data analysis. For the last 10 years or so, Brendan has turned his attention to biology and has pioneered the use of deep learning to understand the genome. He has had a series of high-impact papers in science and nature, and recently he founded the company G Deep Genomics with the goal of turning these breakthroughs into practical healthcare solutions. So please welcome Brennan. Good morning, everyone, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. And right off the bat, I'd like to say thank you to all my uh, colleagues and collaborators and my team at Deep Genomics, which has uh, made all of this work that I'll be talking about today uh, possible. So what I'm going to talk about is the future of medicine. And what I believe is that AI is going to completely change medicine. And also, without artificial intelligence, medicine is going to completely fail. Uh, and I'll present some results to show you kind of what's going on and, and why I believe this is the case. So first of all, I'm going to show a picture of myself because people at the back probably can't see me. <laughs> all right, so, so for those of you at the back, that's what I look like. Um, and now I'm going to tell you a personal story. Um, about 15 years ago, my wife at the time and I uh, found out that the, she was pregnant and we found out the baby she was carrying had a genetic problem. We went to see a genetic counselor and the genetic counselor said essentially it could be nothing, don't worry, or it could be a disaster. And uh, as you can imagine, it was a very difficult time for us uh, emotionally and, and also in terms of trying to make decisions. And what I took out of that experience was really two things. First of all, this wonderful appreciation for machine learning and deep learning I had learned by working with Jeff Hinton, uh, I should put those skills to, to use to solve a bigger problem than detect, detecting cats in YouTube videos. And uh, obviously the problem in front of me was medicine. The second thing I learned is, is the, the potential for machine learning and deep learning to really make a difference. The human genome had just been sequenced <clears throat> at a cost of about a billion dollars, but that cost has come down. And, and so here was this data file that you could download and look at. And people really didn't understand what it meant or how it worked, but I thought that was a good idea uh, for, re for a research problem to, to apply machine learning to. So I'm gonna tell you another story. This is a personal story about a little girl called Nora. Uh, her name's Nora. And she has a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. She's three years old. She's very fortunate to be alive. Most children with spinal muscular atrophy die within the first year or two of life. It's the leading cause of infant mortality in North America. What's interesting about this disease is it has a very simple genetic basis. It's also interesting that it took so long to try to figure out a cure. And I'm going to talk about that later on. It's a really nice end to that story. So some statistics. 65% of the people in this room, or if you think about your loved ones and friends, 65% of you in your lifetime will have a, genetic, a disease with a genetic basis. So it doesn't mean it's just a simple genetic disease, it could be complex like diabetes, but there's a genetic basis to that disease, 65%. If we look at babies, eight million births per year will have a serious, the, the baby will have a serious genetic defect serious one. And if we just look at the U.S. healthcare system, the lifetime cost of such a baby on average is $5 million per baby. So these are some of the numbers. Setting aside all the obvious emotional component to this, these are some of the numbers that give you a sense of the weight of what's going on here. Let's compare this to other markets. If we look at just the U.S. and Europe, 
The healthcare budget last year was $7 trillion. The global, uh, comparing that to the global IT market, that's $3.7 trillion. And if you combine Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, their revenue last year was $0.53 trillion. So it puts these costs in perspective when comparing them with some of these other companies. I mentioned pharmaceuticals before, so <clears throat> this is a very important story. These are recent results, and on, your, on the x-axis here, you're seeing years, so 1990 to 2020. On the y-axis, you're seeing the internal rate of return. Uh, the way to interpret that number is if you're going to invest money in a pharmaceutical company, so this, we're looking at pharmaceutical companies here, versus put your money in the bank and think about getting interest, the, you can compare the internal rate of return to how much you'd get if you just put money in the bank. And you can see how the plot looks. It's, it's pretty devastating. Going from a high value, around 30% in 1990, and around 2012, it actually dropped below the bank rate. So retrospectively, it looks like in 2012, you would have been better off to put your money into, the, into a bank, um, uh, into the bank than put it into a pharmaceutical company. And in 2020, it's expected to drop to zero. It's better to stuff your money on your mattress than put it into a, a pharmaceutical company. All right, so what's the problem? And this is the problem I confronted in 2002 when I decided to switch into this area of genomics and genome biology. It was nicely captured by Eric Lander, uh, who's a, a senior, res a well-respected researcher in the area of genome biology who quipped in 2004, Genome bought the book Hard to Read. So sure, you can sequence the three billion letters, three billion from your mother, three billion from your father, you get the text, but, but what does it mean? What do we do with that text? And that's the main problem confronting genome biology and confronting medicine today. I would argue that's why that curve is dropping to zero. All right, so here's, here's what I've been working on for the last 15 years and a, and a whole bunch of other researchers, many of which are in the audience here today, have been working on as well, is figuring out how to convert the genome to actionable information. So first of all, just a little bit of information about how the genome works. Uh, just a quick, very quick one-minute tutorial on the genome. Three billion letters from your mom, three billion letters from your dad, a sequence of A, C, G, and T. Essentially, each gene consists of a promoter region, which basically activates the gene. There's patterns in that promoter region, signals or words, if you like, that lead that gene to be activated or expressed. And then following that promoter region, there's alternating exons and introns. So the exons here are shown in orange, the introns are shown in light gray. So these patterns alternate, the introns are quite long, 1,000 or 10,000 nucleotides long, the exons are relatively short, around 100 nucleotides long. You could think of the exons as the print statements, if you want to think of this as software. The exons are the print statements. The exons are the parts that end up in the protein. The introns get cut out, they get removed. However, the introns contain crucial control logic. So there are words embedded in the introns that direct the cells, tell the cells how to cut and paste these pieces so as to put these exons together and make the gene. A little bit more biology. This is a picture that depicts the central dogma of genome biology. We go from DNA, which is a sequence of these A, C, Gs, and Ts. The gene is transcribed into RNA, and then the RNA is processed in various ways. For example, those introns are cut out. That's a step, that, a step of processing that occurs on the RNA. And then the RNA is translated into protein. Now, the picture is much more complicated than this. As you might guess, biology is complicated and multi-layered. And so proteins go back and interact with DNA. In fact, a protein is what causes gene expression to occur. A protein binds to the promoter of the DNA, of, of the gene. Uh, proteins also interact with RNA. RNA interacts with RNA. RNA interacts with proteins. So you have all of these arrows going back and forth relating these different entities. So biology is complex. And I think something that we need to appreciate going forward is that really biology is too complex for any one researcher or any group of researchers to understand. So that has implications for how we're going to go forward. And 
Uh, another way to view this is that really in the last few years, our ability to measure our biology, whether it's with a Fitbit or different technologies that allow you to measure metabolites or your genome, different sorts of things going on inside of your body, our ability to measure our biology and our ability to alter our biology using things like DNA editing has far surpassed our ability to understand our biology. So humans are, are kind of out of the loop going forward. All right, so let's think, let's think about how we, this community here, and the many researchers already working in this area, can have an impact. So first of all, I want to talk about data sets, right? Machine learning researchers, AI researchers, they like data sets. So here are a few examples of different kinds of data in this community. So on the x-axis here, I was plotted the average gigabytes per data set, so how big the data set is. On the y-axis, the number of data sets that you can download from the internet of that size. So targeted RNA, that's the, the, that intermediate molecule, DNA, RNA, protein. Targeted RNA, there have been, there's been a technology around for 30 years that allows you to read out the sequence of that RNA molecule. And so people have looked at very narrowly focused examples, a particular gene, or they look at a few genes. That's called a gene panel. And you can see here that those data sets are small. There's a very large number of such data sets, over, uh, just under a million data sets of that size. In the far upper right, those are the genome sequencing data sets, so DNA. So that's where the entire sequence of three billion letters is produced. That's the data file you download. And there's, only, there's, there's over a million of those data sets. You can also see RNA data sets. Those are data sets where uh, people, researchers take samples out of your cells and then look at all of the RNA molecules in your cells. So these are big data sets. And you can download them. Uh, oh, another interesting one is over there in the lower right, 3D DNA. I might have time to talk about that later. So what I'm going to do next is tell you a little bit about a, a few examples of things that people have worked on in the community, uh, and a couple examples from my group and Deep Genomics. Uh, one of the examples goes back to 2010. This is where we use machine learning to understand how words embedded in introns control those print statements, splicing, which puts exons into the proteins. And we were able to use machine learning to reverse engineer, if you like, infer those code words and how that works, that, that regulatory code, using data sets. Another recent example, and this is work by uh, Jeff Bilms and Bill Noble, is, oh, no, that's not the slide. This is, this is uh, uh, Nir Friedman and uh, uh, Viv Rejev's work is something really neat called a, a giga parallel reporter assay. So about uh, five years ago, there was something called a mega or, or a massively parallel reporting assay, which allowed us to synthesize 100,000 genes. This was in yeast. But now, just, just uh, recently, this paper was published where uh, over 100 million synthetic yeast genes were produced. And so instead of, instead of trying to understand the natural system, which is what we did in that, in that nature paper, what they're doing here is just generating artificial genes, a huge number of artificial genes, and then trying to, again, figure out how the biology works. <clears throat> Another example is, uh, if you think back to that diagram I showed you where proteins can interact with RNA and proteins can interact with DNA, there are data sets that allow you to measure interactions between proteins and DNA and understand how that works. So this is some work that my group recently, recently did where we took a data set from Ray et al, which is 240,000 designed sequences. Okay, so this is RNA or DNA sequences that are artificially designed. And then for a given protein, you can see where the protein sticks. Which of those sequences does that protein like to bind to? And so this gives you a big data matrix of 240,000 designed sequences by 200 proteins. And the machine learning task here is to learn how to take a sequence and from the sequence predict whether the protein will bind or not. So what do we do with that data? So this was work that we published in Nature Biotechnology in 2015. 
This is a, a convolutional net. The way it works is we, we take the mini batches which contain these, these sequences that were designed, so those are fed in. A convolutional network just sweeps patterns or filters across those different sequences. And so for each of the sequences, we get some intermediate representation. This is in a standard conv convolutional network that, that you would use for computer vision. That intermediate representation is then fe fed into different layers of convolution and pooling. Uh, also, of course, fully connected layers, which, which, um, uh, which produce the output. And then the output is compared to the measurement, the stuff I just showed you there in that big matrix. And then back propagation is used to update the parameters. So why, why I'm showing you this is to show you that really it's a fairly simple machine learning problem. Given the data sets, given properly uh, processed data sets and organized data sets, you can have a big impact in this field. One of the challenges is figuring out the right metric. And so here we're comparing the measured binding affinity, how much that protein actually sticks to the sequence to the output of the neural network, and what is the right cost function for producing a neural network that is useful in practice. And that's one of the things that my colleagues here explored is different kinds of cost functions. So what would we do with this neural net, right? If you downloaded one of these data sets and trained a neural network, what would you do with it? So here's an, an example that shows you how you can use that model that I just showed you to identify pathological mutations and even figure out how to possibly fix them. So down on the lower left, what you're seeing is a sequence from the uh, cholesterol gene, LDLR. This is it from the promoter of that gene. And the sequence was fed into that model I just showed you, that it, that it was trained to predict binding affinity of proteins. So the sequence was fed into that model, and then the output of the neural network, which tells you its prediction for uh, how strongly the protein will bind to the sequence, is shown using the heights of these, uh, of these letters, okay? So you see the letters A, T, C, G, and the height of the letter corresponds to the output of the neural network. So then what we did is we artificially, in silico, looked at every possible mutation in the promoter. So for each nucleotide, say the nucleotide had a value of A, we would switch it to G, C, and T, and for each of those possibilities, we'd run the entire promoter through our neural network and look at the output of the neural network. So now we can see for each of those possible mutations how much the mutation changes the output. That is, how much our neural network predicts that that mutation will disrupt protein binding. And it turns out protein binding, correctly or incorrectly, is crucial for health. So that's what the white box down below shows you. All right, so for each of the letters A, C, G, and T, there's a color code where pink or bright red indicates a positive mutation so that's a mutation that will cause the protein to bind more strongly. And the blue indicates a negative mutation where the protein will, will bind more weakly. All right. And the rows are, you can see the, the key on the far left, the rows are organized as A, C, G, or T. So if the, if the sequence has a G in it, and then you look at the row corresponding to G, it's just white, that's because you haven't made a mutation. You've changed the G to a G. So there's no change in the output of the neural network. On the other hand, if you look at an example where the, uh, the, the original promoter has a T, and look at that column, you'll see switching it from T to different letters has a, has a big impact. <coughs> there we go. So if we look at this example here, this letter T, this is uh, in, the, in the naturally occurring promoter, there's a T at this location. If it's mutated to a C, there's a large drop in the binding affinity of that protein. If it's mutated to a G, there's a strong increase in the binding affinity of that protein. So, now what do we do with this map? We can compare it to known results, and these are mutations that are in a database of carefully curated mutations corresponding to diseases involving cholesterol levels. And you can see, first of all, there's good agreement. If you compare the yellow dots, which is the known disease mutations, to our, our map, mutation map, if you like, of these mutations, there's good agreement. And then you also see that in some cases our model makes predictions that have not been seen before in the clinic. And so if we look, for example, in this column here where the naturally occurring letter is a C, our model predicts if it's mutated to an A, we'll see a big drop in the level of protein binding. 
Another example, this is the example from, uh, from Vilms and, uh, and Noble. And uh, this one is for figuring out the 3D st structure, uh, or the, the contact, the chromatin interaction structure, I should say, of DNA. So DNA is wrapped up into chromatin, and what's important for transcription, this process of gene expression, is the structure of this chromatin. For example, the chromatin can touch itself, and that can help enhance gene expression. And so the data, which is shown at the bottom here, can be viewed as a, as a um, sort of a matrix form. So if you look over here, uh, different locations here are different nucleotides in the DNA sequence, wrapped up in the chromatin. And then what this map tells you is if you compare two locations, how strongly they like to interact. So if two parts of the DNA are brought together like that, then you get a bright, a bright dot here indicating this contact. Okay, so that's how the data is expressed. And this was experimentally measured. And then what these researchers did is they trained a multi-layer convolutional network to take as input the raw DNA sequence and also a signal called chromatin accessibility, which just basically tells you how available the DNA is. And so is it unwrapped or does it tend to be bundled up into the chromatin and not available? So they took those two tracks, one's just the raw sequence of DNA, the other one's just exposure or DNA accessibility track, and they, they fed in, you, you get two pieces of information. One piece of information is for this part of the DNA, another one's for this part, so you get the two sequences, the two chromatin accessibility tracks. Those are fed into the convolutional neural net, these two different, two different channels here, the upper channel and the lower channel. There's different layers of convolution and pooling, and then they're brought together in the final few stages, which involve fully connected or dense layers, D for dense here. And then the output of that system is predicting the probability of contact. And so again, since bringing these two pieces of DNA together and having them touch is crucial for gene expression, if a mutation disrupts this process, and the neural network can predict that the mutation will disrupt this process, we can use it to identify pathological mutations. So those were just a few examples. And now what I want to do is <coughs> spend the rest of, the, of my talk discussing what I'm most excited about right now, which is my spin-out company, Deep Genomics, and what we're doing at Deep Genomics. Uh, <coughs> so the, the story I gave you before about my personal situation really is what uh, inspired me to work in this field. And over the past 15 years, from 2002 to th till 2017, we published a bunch of papers in Nature and Science and Cell, so all the basic research went well. But in 2015, my colleagues and I realized that the machine learning systems that we'd come up with were accurate enough that we could actually analyze clinical mutations and identify mechanisms that had, nev had never been seen before. So we realized there was an opportunity to really change the lives of patients. And so at that point in time, we decided to spin out Deep Genomics. So the goal of Deep Genomics is to build an AI platform for detecting and treating genetic disease. So this picture here kind of shows you the different steps in going from patient mutations to helping people. And for the first year or two, we, we spent a lot of time on developing genome processing tools. So these will be tools that allow you, <coughs> these will be tools that allow you, for example, to identify mutations. Uh, there was just an announcement, I think, yesterday or today. Uh, uh, Google announced uh, the release of Deep Variant. So that's a deep learning technique that allows you to identify mutations very accurately. So that would be an example of a, of a genome processing tool. Uh, at Deep Genomics, we, pr we produce our own toolkit. We call it Genome Kit, and it's about 20 to 800 times faster than some of the publicly available tools like Hale and, and SAM tools, things like that. However, that's really just the first step, right? Being able to read out a person's mutations, that's great. But we're back to that old problem that Eric Lander posed, which is, okay, so what do we do with that? So really, the two bigger elephants in the room are the middle one, which is taking those mutations and figuring out what is the mechanism? What's the disease mechanism? Is it pathological? Or is it a mutation that just simply changes hair color or eye color? And then the third one, of course, is actually helping patients. 
So how do we make a difference to patients? We need therapies or we need to change behavior so they lead healthier lives. And that's the toughest one, of course, for a variety of reasons. So we're going to come back to that spin rat or the, the spinal muscular atrophy example. And so the really exciting and good news is that researchers believe we may have a cure for spinal muscular atrophy. A clinical trial was run uh, just over a year ago and was terminated early last December, December of 2016, because the efficacy of the drug was so high for the children in the trial that it was determined it would be unethical to continue to give the other children placebo, the ones that were receiving placebo. So it was terminated early and the, the FDA approved the drug very rapidly within, within a couple months. And again, within a couple months of that, Europe approved the drug, which is unusual. You don't see drugs approved so quickly in Europe compared to the United States uh, for various reasons. So this was exceptional. Within two months, it was approved in Europe. So I'm actually going to show you some of the details of how this drug works. It's, it's a really exciting example to look at. <clears throat> and it's an example of what I call a digital medicine. So that's what's really cool for this audience. So we have the genome, right? It's digital. You can download it. And it turns out there's this whole world of digital medicines. Okay, so it's not like squishy cartoon diagrams showing this interacting with this. The medicine is specified digitally. It's synthesized digitally. So we've got like a digital genome with digital mutations. We've got a fix that's digital. It's a really good opportunity for people who like to think about information that way. So coming back to, to spinal muscular atrophy, the cause of this disease is, is a bit complicated, but you can boil it down to a mutation in one of the exons. So I told you before about introns and exons. They're alternating. So one of the exons in a gene called SMA, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, <clears throat> has a mutation shown here. So a C is mutated to a T. And that mutation causes splicing to go wrong. That is, this exon, which was supposed to be put into the protein, is skipped. It's not included in the protein. That's what this mutation causes to happen. How does the medicine work? Well, you might think that the medicine would target that particular mutation. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9. And the thing that pops into your mind right away is, oh yeah, we can just edit the mutation. Uh, not so. <laughs> CRISPR-Cas9 has been referred to by some of the senior researchers in the field as something that's more of a DNA damage repair type of process. Rather than thinking about it as a process where you can pinpoint a mutation and fix it, it's a lot more loosey-goosey than that. <laughs> First of all, it's hard to pinpoint a mutation and fix it, and second of all, it has off-target effects. So it'll, that means it'll make all sorts of changes all over the place. And Jennifer Lizgarten, who's a, a leader in this field, has been working on techniques for, for predicting those off-target effects. All right, so, so we can't just fix the mutation, and in fact, this Spinraza drug doesn't, doesn't just fix the mutation. What it does is it modulates the DNA way down here. So on the other side of the exon, the next intron, in fact, so again, this is not even the protein coding part, this is the intron, the medicine binds, matches up to that sequence, binds to it, and causes that exon to be included. That's how the medicine works. Now, what's also neat about this medicine, so there's really two interesting things apart about it. First of all, it's digital. So the way it works is there's a reverse complement sequence here. So G's and C's get paired, T's and A's get paired. And so literally, the medicine is a nucleotide sequence. It's, it's synthesized uh, nucleotide by nucleotide. And you get a, a vial with a whole bunch of those molecules in the vial. And those get injected into the spinal cord of the, the, the cerebral spinal fluid of the patient. And it's just a reverse complement sequence to that intronic sequence. That's, that's, the, that's the way you design the, the drug. The other interesting aspect to this drug is it's binding in the intron. So it's not directly changing that mutation. It's altering the control logic that I mentioned before. These words, if you like, that are embedded in the introns that control whether the exon will be included or not. So that's a great opportunity for us, this, this digital aspect of, of, of what's going on. So <clears throat> let's look at the timeline for the development of Spinraza. Spinraza, this drug, is very effective. It's saved hundreds of lives already. And it costs $750,000 per baby per year. 
So this is a problem, right? This is, this is a, a, big, a big issue, the cost of the drug. We can't keep making drugs that cost this much. So let's see why it costs that much. And if you look at the timeline for the development of Spinraza, it was first started around 2000. There were, there were several failed compounds and initial drugs that were tested over the next eight years until around 2008. Uh, the, the drug that turned out to work well was then tested for the next few years. And then in 2012, clinical trials were started. And so the goal at deep genomics is to use these machine learning models we talked about earlier to accelerate that first piece of research from eight years down to a couple years. And then furthermore, we're also going to use artificial intelligence to accelerate clinical trials, toxicity studies, and other aspects of drug development. So the whole idea is reduce the amount of time needed to develop the drug. So how are we going to do that? Uh, I can't tell you the, the, the minute details, but I can give you a high-level picture. And it turns out that drug development is not that complex to understand. You've got patient genetic data, that's what you start with, clinical mutations. Then you need to find what is the disease mechanism. So in the case of spinal muscular atrophy, the mechanism is that the exon is skipped. Then the next thing you need to do is figure out a mechanism of action. How are you going to remediate that problem? So in the case of spinal muscular atrophy, we want the exon to be included. Sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes a mutation will cause the protein to, to go wrong, and the way to fix it is to not try to correct that protein, but to introduce some other protein that can compensate for it. So increase the expression level, for example, of another protein. So the mechanism of the disease and the mechanism of action of a potential drug may not be uh, the inverse of one another. So that's your, your mechanism of action for your compound. The next step is to design a drug. Now that's really cool, the idea of designing a drug. Small molecule drugs, which is the bulk of pharmaceutical industry today, essentially consists of a giant library of compounds, 100,000 or a million compounds, and when you have what's called a target, which is crudely speaking a protein or a pathway or something you're trying to change, you just screen those compounds against that protein or that pathway until you find one that works. With digital medicines, we can take a very different approach. If we know what the, the mechanism of action is that we're trying to achieve, and we have machine learning systems, like the ones I just talked about, that allow us to simulate the effects of modifying DNA or modifying RNA, we can, in silico, essentially design the compound that we'd like to test. So that's fi figuring out compounds. Now, the machine learning is not going to work perfectly, of course. Uh, and in the case of Spinraza, for example, at Deep Genomics, we retrospectively looked at Spinraza. We, we in silico, evaluated 200 compounds, 200 of these genetic medicines I showed you, uh, ran them through our machine learning systems, and scored, scored these 200 compounds. And the actual Spinraza drug was the third from the top. So we were pretty close. So a purely experimental technique would require experimentally testing all 200 compounds. Ours put the actual drug in the top three. And it could be that the top two are actually more effective than the Spinraza drug. So now what? <clears throat> so I talked about starting with the patient data, identifying the disease mechanism, identifying how you're going to remediate that mechanism. The next thing you need to do is test it in the wet lab. Do experimental work to see if it actually alters cells in the way, in the way that you predict that it will, will alter cells. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, the next thing is, is what's called toxicity, or off-target effects. So is that compound going to cause something else nasty to occur? Right? Is it going to change some other part of the genome, have some unintended consequence? So that's the next step in this drug development process, is toxicity. And then the next step is clinical trials. And in the case of clinical trials, one of the biggest problems facing pharmaceutical companies today is patient stratification, which just means that an intended patient group for a particular indication actually consists of a whole bunch of patient subgroups, each of which is going to respond quite differently to the drug. And so if you could more precisely pinpoint those, spatial, those, those patient subgroups and evaluate them separately, you may be able to achieve higher efficacy. And that sort of gets into the area of personalized medicine. The next thing you do is, is after running these clinical trials, of course, 
uh, marketing and, and distribution and all of that. Now, <clears throat> all of that costs a heck of a lot of money. If you're making drugs that don't really work very well and have a lot of nasty side effects, you need to do a lot of marketing to convince people that they should buy these drugs or to convince insurance companies to pay for them. And you need to have large legal teams to deal with all the litigation that's going to, to, to uh, follow. Let's come back to spinal muscular atrophy and Spinraza. They don't need any marketing at all. It's, it, it was highly effective in 82 out of 120 kids in the clinical trial. We don't normally see that kind of efficacy, uh, say for a cholesterol drug. So, so if we can do a really good job of designing medicines that work very well, then we also can save a whole bunch of money on marketing things that don't work and also on, on litigation. All right, so that's basically it. So those are the steps. And the question is, how can we use AI and machine learning to accelerate each and every one of those steps? Reduce costs, make, them, make it faster, make it more accurate. So at Deep Genomics, we're using our machine learning systems to design compounds, as I mentioned before. And we're also testing them in our wet lab. So this is not just an AI company. We're synthesizing compounds. We're testing them in, cell, in human cells, seeing if they work. And we'll be going further with them as well. One thing I wanted to mention is there's an exciting opportunity. Just as cloud computing has rapidly accelerated our ability to build tr and train machine learning models, among other things, there's something called a cloud laboratory, which we've used at Deep Genomics. A cloud lab, what happens is we upload a Python script. I'm not kidding, it's literally a Python script. We upload the Python script, say transcripti transcriptic or emerald. This is a picture of emerald. And once that Python script is uploaded, it specifies the experimental protocol, and then robots go and conduct the experiments. That's the interface, a Python script. So these labs are, have just uh, come into existence in the last few years. There's a lot of kinks that need to be worked out, but they offer the opportunity to rapidly scale up our ability to do experimental work, test compounds, and of course, solve other problems. So in the next five minutes or so, I just want to talk about a few issues that pertain to this community, people working in the area of artificial intelligence and machine learning. One of the, the things that's very important in medicine is earning the trust of the stakeholders. Stakeholders are the patient, the physician treating the patient, the insurance company who may be paying for the treatment, different technology providers, and the hospitals. And in machine learning, we're often criticized for producing black boxes, right, that aren't open to interpretation. And that's considered to be an issue with respect to gaining the trust of stakeholders. I actually think that's a red herring. I think that, yes, we need to get the trust of the stakeholders. But the way to do that is to figure out exactly what it is they need in order to gain the trust. So for example, if we have an automated system that's just a heck of a lot more accurate than humans, then over time, maybe it'll just be a few years, we will gain trust. If we come back to detecting disease mutations that are pathogenic, for example, the deep genomic system for a certain class of mutations achieves 95% accuracy when compared to leading pathologists in the field. Whereas if you send your sample, your genetic sample, to two different clinics, they will agree only between 50% and 75% of the time. So human accuracy is maybe not what many people think it is. So that's one aspect, is just accuracy. But there is something to explaining how the system works, right? And there are different ways we can do that. One way of coming up with explanations for the conclusion that the system comes to, say, recommending a double mastectomy, is to have a system that actually pinpoints the biology of what's going on. So instead of just outputting double mastectomy, the system says, you have a mutation in BRCA1, and that mutation is going to cause splicing to go wrong, that's going to lead to a malfunctioning protein, and that malfunctioning protein has been shown to lead to breast cancer with a certain probability. So having those intermediate steps is important, and that's the whole uh, uh, approach that I'm uh, uh, a proponent of. Um, another one is to have machine learning systems that literally output an explanation in the form of English language. Uh, so that's relevant to things that people have been working on in this community on capture generation. Here's an image, generate a, uh, a caption that corresponds to that image. And 
And the, I guess the idea there is if you're trying to convince a particular stakeholder, say a medical doctor or something, why not output an explanation that's perfectly suited to that stakeholder? Another, uh, so, so Deep Dream, so this was mentioned last night, uh, and there was a display last night of deep, deep art. Um, so the idea there is you have a supervised neural network that takes an image as the input and then outputs a, a class label for dog or something like that. And then you take any image and then you just modify the image, like iteratively update the pixels, so it, look, it gets more, it's classified more likely to be a dog. And so that gives you these wild psychedelic images. The reason I'm showing you this is this is exactly what we do not want in medicine. <laughs> so <laughs> this, is, this would be a disaster, right? You modify the DNA until you get some sort of horrendous uh, uh, <laughs> and implausible, actually, uh, a sequence of, of genetic code. Um, and so the answer here is probably generative models, models that are able to also tell you what's not plausible, right? What, what you don't want in the input. So they model the actual distribution of the input, not just the, the class label. Uh, the other thing I wanted to comment on is the, the recent exciting results from DeepMind on game playing, different kinds of game playing, so AlphaGo and that kind of thing. Uh, so what's different between that and biology? Well, first of all, in biology we don't know the rules, whereas in Go you do know the rules. Uh, the universe is not fully observed in biology, it's mostly not observed, uh, unlike the game of Go where you see the board and the universe is fully observed. And the other interesting aspect that confronts us in working, for, uh, working on machine learning for genomics and medicine is that humans are good at things like playing games. We invented them. Humans are good at computer vision. We evolved to solve vision problems over millions of years. Humans are good at language. We invented it. But medicine, biology, we're not good at it. So we need some kind of a superhuman AI to deal with that problem. And the last thing I'll, I'll say before we move to, to questions is I just want to tell you what we're working on now at Deep Genomics and what we're going to figure out in the next few years. So the primary thing we're working on is Project Saturn. The idea is to use our machine learning systems to scan a vast space of about 69 billion molecules, all in silico, identify about a thousand compounds which we call active compounds. These are compounds that allow us to manipulate cell biology. Think about it as a thousand control knobs that we can turn and twist to adjust what's going insi on inside of cells, a toolkit for therapeutic development. And we'll have three compounds in clinical trials within the next three years. Thank you. So we have plenty of time for questions, so please come up to the microphones. Uh, Brendan, thank you very much. It was absolutely fascinating talk. So I know nothing about genomics, but I would like to ask a question as an information theorist and machine learning scientist. So you mentioned there are six billion elements or symbols from the alphabet of four which makes it uh, 12 uh, gigabits, which is about 1.5 gigabytes of data. So the NIPS 2017 uh, total proceedings in PDFs are about 800, uh, 800 uh, megabytes. So, it's, so genome is just twice the size of the NIPS 2017 proceedings. And it encodes like everything about human body or, you know, brain and everything. It's really hard to believe that that information content is enough to encode so much. So my question is more about coverage, like you were addressing the issues of kind of accuracy. So I would ask a question about coverage. Like, can we address all the diseases by modifying genome? Or there is something besides genome, like RNAs, proteins, which also have to be kind of treated in some way in order to address the other diseases? Yeah, yeah so that's a good question. <clears throat> so one thing I would say about the proceedings as well as the genome is, of course, you shouldn't just look at the length, you should compress. So the question is, you take the, the NIPS proceedings and compress it, how big is that file? <laughs> well, and then the same thing with genomes. Um, uh, yeah, so <clears throat> the, uh, what we're assuming is that really the, the DNA, the genome, the text of the genome is the primary determinant. 
And uh, that's not true. There are obviously environmental factors, what you eat or, or different kinds of environmental factors are, are important. However, uh, my experience is that a lot of people who try to account for everything all at once uh, come up with kind of a tangled web of correlations and it's really hard to figure out what action to take. Uh, we definitely know that the DNA sequence is a primary determinant of many of your characteristics. It's the cause. It's the cause of many of your characteristics. So from my perspective, it's a really good thing to start with. And for now, we're just kind of ignoring the other things and just and saying, well, the first order, the genome, is going to be the primary determinant. Thank you. Yep. So this question actually follows up with that previous one. Obviously, genetics is one major part of someone's disease or profile. There's also nurture as well as nature. There's factors that come from one's environment, like you just mentioned a moment ago. Are you planning to incorporate something like metabolomics as a way to look at the environmental factors and as well as the gut microbiome? Um, uh, so the, <clears throat> the question is about the microbiome, for instance? Well, or? well the whole environmental issue. So one would be yeah. metabolomics to look at the environmental yeah. stresses, and second is the gut microbiome as another yeah. factor. Yeah. So, so genomics is one kind of data. I mentioned RNA data, protein data, metabolomics is another great source of data. Uh, and then all sorts of just personal information, even things you can measure from your Fitbit, right? All of that is really good information. I think the challenge for us, though, is to come up with causal models. So correlative models can, it, can ass assess risk, but they don't allow intervention to figure out what you should change to, to change the consequences, right? So, so I think coming up with causal models is really, really important. <coughs> So you described um, very large data sets of genomics and proteins and such, and then also the <coughs> desire to explain things in natural language, uh, to explain to humans. Where do you get the data or the training methods for that aspect of it? Do you have ideas? How, where do we get the training methods for? For, the, for natu if you're planning to do natural language explanation oh, in the end. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, good question. Um, so at this point in time, I don't know. <laughs> So the approach we're taking right now is, is more to think about what, a, what kind of data a pathologist or a physician would look at to be convinced, and then train the machine learning systems to output that kind of data. And there are interesting uh, questions like online learning, right? So, so the system can have some data get trained up and then make a prediction that can be compared against some new data and then fed back into the machine learning system. But yeah, at this point of time, we're not actually at Deep Genomics generating natural language interpretations, but I think that is a good uh, uh, area to work on, yeah. So uh, would you agree that uh, machine learning, the way we are applying, is really a shortcut to scientific simulations based on some uh, scientific models? And do you see yourselves eventually, up, as you gain more insights, coming up with those scientific models and simulations yeah. to ultimately that's, replace that's machine learning? That's a great question. So, so when I showed that diagram of biology and I said biology is really complicated, uh, what's the right solution? And I said machine learning. Uh, thanks for asking that question because historically two other approaches have been tried. One of them is rule-based systems. Uh, that did not work out well. And the other one is molecular simulation or where you simulate stochastic differential equations to try to predict what's going to happen. The problem with molecular simulation or stochastic differential equations is that they only work when you know exactly what's in your test tube. So there are three molecules and you can measure or, or quantify the three concentrations and then you can write down a mathematical model of how they're going to interact with one another. Uh, but biology uh, is, is much more complicated than that. Most of the molecules we, we don't even know about and, we, and, and there's a lot of biological noise as well. And so those models, molecular simulation and stochastic differential equations break down when there are those unknowns. So I, I think machine learning will, will continue to be the technology that moves but us forward in medicine. Do you see that at least as a goal worth pursuing, that you eventually want scientific models and real scientific simulations? Because machine learning, all said and done, still, I mean, feels like pseudoscience. Uh, the machine learning can pinpoint predictions that can be then verified experimentally to satisfy the curiosity of a scientist. Yeah. Okay, so last question. Uh, great talk, thank you. Uh, I had one more uh, question related to that, which is uh, there is a big difference between computational biology and NLP or vision, which is that you're particularly interested in causal models, which you alluded to. 
However, uh, inferring causal models from purely observational data, uh, for example, you showed a lot of DNA, RNA data sets, which are purely observational. And uh, how do you propose that we can potentially exploit those to come up with causal models? Uh, how, do we, how, how can we ex exploit what? Uh, the large amount of data, which is purely observational, to come up with causal models. Oh, causal models, right. How do we go from observational data to causal models, yeah. I think sort of the same way humans do. <laughs> so so uh, we, we can make inferences about causality based on observational data. Sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. But they at least give us a, a way of exploring a hypothesis space, right? So, so once you've kind of narrowed down, uh, for example, if there's absolutely no correlation, uh, except in unusual circumstances, there's unlikely to be causation. So, so correlation can be used to identify some subset of hypotheses, and now the question is, how do you whittle that down? And that comes back to this sort of online type of process I was talking about, where the machine learning system, based on observational data, can make uh, predictions for what new data should be gathered, which would be like causal inter intervention, uh, and then new data gathered. But even, a even an experiment that's meant to identify uh, a, a causal mechanism is not guaranteed to do so. It's still actually obviously just a new experiment with some new data and correlation and, you know, measure correlation again. But it's an iterative process that ev eventually whittles the space down until you find a, a mechanism that's very likely to be causal. And if you can develop a drug based on that that works, then that's enough. Yep. Okay, well, thanks very much. So we'll have to just move on to the uh, right. next talk. So let's thank Brendan again.